Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the next in the series of Cocktail Chats with Auckland Art Gallery Foundation. And tonight we have with us Mary Kisler in conversation with Michael Lett. Um, thank you for joining us, Michael and Mary. Lovely to have you with us. Well, it's great to be together. Yeah, it's so nice. <laughs> to, to perforate at the bubble. There we are. We just have to have that very cool <laughs> image, even though Michael doesn't want it, because I think it looks fantastic. And one of the lovely things about doing these PowerPoints is you can play around. So I took a little detail of the three, uh, three images taken from different artists' work and just incorporated them. But in order not to embarrass Michael further, we'll, <laughs> we'll go on to the, <clears throat> the first one, which is this uh, show that you had, which I saw at the gallery, of Anne Hamlet's early works. But you've really, like so many of the dealers at the moment, the gallerists at the moment, you've really been hit hard, haven't, or the artists as well have been hit hard by what happened with COVID. So can you just talk us through a little bit and what that meant for you and for the, your particular um, artists? Oh, uh, sure. Um, I think like every business, there have been some major blows and um, why this slide is up is because one of the blows was that we had to close an exhibition that I uh, and my small team had been working on uh, for a while. It was a bit of a labour of love, a uh, exhibition of early works by Anne Hamlet, which uh, as many of you will know, uh, is uh, Anne was the wife of Colin McCann. Um, and in a way we wanted to do something that was slightly subversive uh, for Colin's uh, centenary. We had borrowed a number, well, all of the works were borrowed, but we had borrowed works from a couple of institutions, which is a kind of special thing for a gallery such as mine. Um, and yes, I mean, it's, it's certainly sad to suddenly find yourself closing an exhibition only 10 days into that show, mm. uh, when you've put a lot of work into it. Uh, but it wasn't just that. Um, we've had all three of the art fairs that we had signed up for uh, cancel on us, all with various consequences as well. Um, we have had, all, a lot of our artists have had projects cancelled as well, some of them many projects. Um, but already, you know, there are some mm -hmm. Some clouds are lifting and there are some things mm. in the works and we're quietly getting ready to reopen the gallery and whatever that means. Have you got a date? Yes, we do. We sort of keep on changing it slightly, but on the 3rd of June, we're just going to have the door open Fantastic. and we will begin. Fantastic. The year. Yeah. Well, of course, I responded, as you can imagine, very much to this, to Anne's show, because A, I'd never really seen much of her work before, but in light of the Francis Hodgkins exhibition, where I'd looked so much at the sort of painterly uh, development of artists and that focus on the still life, which was so powerful, in particularly in English modern art at the time. And mm. there was a wonderful link, I felt, between, Anne's work and and Hodgkins, but mm. I, what fascinated me in your show was this work piece arranged from Bendigo because when I first look at it looked at it I could see Toss Wollaston. Yes, well of course Toss was I think a friend yeah, at that Toss. point as well, yeah. and I have to say that the show really was put together by the wonderful Linda Tyler, who mm. is just the leading authority on Anne Hamlet, mm. and she literally knows where all of the works are. I think there's only maybe 25, 30 works, um, of which we had 20 of them. Um, some are with the family, but a lot are with friends. She only sold one work uh, in her lifetime. Good Lord. Uh, a little <clears throat> bit like Vincent van Gogh, but it is um, an extremely beautiful, I'm sorry we don't have a slide of it, but it's an extremely beautiful work and a work that really does remind me of Francis Hodgkins right. as well. It's sort of well. One of the things I think, one of the advantages, if you like, of turning adversity into advantage of, of, of lockdown is, you know, I came to that exhibition, but putting this together, it really gave me time to look over a period of hours at an artwork rather than just 
five or ten minutes in, in a gallery because yes. you're always moving on to look at the next thing. And I was fascinated by the unfinishedness of her work, that notion of, you know, which is the, 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 the real mountain range and the reflection, the division on that um, uh, border, uh, mm. you know. It, there's, there's so much in this particular work and her brush strokes, that thing, you know, so many of those artists were leaving, if they were using canvas, leaving part of the canvas bare in that um, modern period. And and you see it even more, and I think... This, ah, there's, sorry, that is, is this the, the work? That is the work this is the work to. that I absolutely fell in love with. And mm. it was partly because it made me think of a theatre. You know, when you look at it, yes, you think of it as a window ledge, perhaps, but you don't see a reflection behind it. You've got those curtains, and it's almost like the vase of flowers is on a stage, particularly with that line of light coming across the sideboard or the window ledge or whatever it is that it's resting on. I mean, this is a major painting, I think, of well, its time. I agree. I mean, I think that I'm fascinated by um, people such as and because although there has been an exhibition here and there i feel like you know she has been somewhat forgotten mm, yeah. in a way and she um she's not represented really in any of our public collections uh to papa owns a small pencil drawing by by her and of course the hocken have some works that were gifted to them i think by Anne. right um but you know of recent times there has been a huge amount of focus by museums and public art galleries on kind of recentering things and re readdressing these moments and i guess in my own gallery that's on my mind as well i mean a lot of people who visited the show said why have you put this exhibition on nothing's for sale you know so forth but it's never really been uh my sole focus to just make show after show which is somehow just a kind of glamorous shop you know i really do love moments mm. where we can pause and be a little bit more studious and um present i hope exhibitions that are just as worthy as shows that are put on by some of our public galleries mm. and kind of take people by surprise so but the other thing about a work like this, and it again, it really takes me back to Hodgkin, she was very influential on other younger modernists. Yes. And when I look at a painting like this, you know, this is so modern in that she's not trying to blend the brush strokes. She's giving each band of colour its own sort of weight and balance. Yes. All those textures that you've built up. And if you're a young painter looking at a work like this, and this is done 1939, before any of Hodgkin's major oils had come back mm. to New Zealand. Mm. A work like this, if it had been seen at the time, would have been extremely influential. Yes. And I mean, our next artist, yes. who's Imogen Taylor, has she did she see that show of your of, of she, Anne? I don't think she did actually. That's a good question. I sh no, I don't think she did because Imogen, um, for those of you who know Imogen Taylor, she has been really working so hard. She's, I mean, this exhibition that you're looking at here is an installation shot of a show at the Hocken. Um, she has been the artist in residence in Dunedin. Uh, well, was the artist in mm. residence for uh, the tail end of last year and also a little bit of this year for one reason or another. Um, and almost as soon as she made this show, she uh, hopped on a plane and I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but it's part of the story. She it jumped is. on a plane and <clears throat> um, went off to New York where she began a residency at uh, the ICP, which was part of her winning the Wallace um, Award uh, 18 months or so ago. Uh, so that's all me saying she's been busy. She yes. hasn't been flying up to Auckland as much as... No, she's, uh, been, she's yeah. been very, very busy. And I, you know, I saw her work in Dunedin when I was down there installing the Hodgkin show mm -hmm. and have seen her work before. But what I loved about this was that war piece Yes. Because at, at one of the things that really fascinates me about this particular show is the whole gallery is the installation, isn't it? It's true. You know, you think yeah. about Anne and that the works are incredibly beautiful and, and I love the way you laid them out. But here, it's a really immersive experience. 
Yes. And is this a new thing for Imogen? I mean, doing that whole wall on the left-hand side of this image, it's, it's wonderfully theatrical again. Yes. Was she the, the mural that you can see on the left-hand side was made in collaboration with her partner, uh, the architect Sue yeah. Hillary. And um, I think that it's extremely successful for mm. lots of reasons, but it really does tie the whole show together. Mm. When you walk into that, I don't know if all of you have been to the Hocken, but it's a reasonably modest space. Mm. Uh, and obviously I'm incredibly biased, but I think that Imogen and oh, she's, Sue have- She's been, transformed it. Exactly. I mean, it's in a very, very sharp show. And I don't know what other images we have, but she also included images um, from uh, the Hocken collection. Uh, including Frances oh, Hodgkins. Yeah, no, I didn't. Let, we, I wasn't sent a slide. No, there. apologies. No, but, no that's um, fine. But Imogen is an artist who is intensely interested in people like Anne Hamlet mm -hmm. and Louise Henderson and others from that generation. You know, a generation of artists. They, who they were real role models. Exactly. But they, yeah. and, and groundbreakers in their own way. But there's also something very exciting for me personally looking at that work because. I was in Rome once and they had got a uh, hold of Picasso's, the screen, the um, set he'd done for facade, for the oh, performance yes. of P facade in Paris. And it's absolutely huge. And they hung it at um, Palazzo Barberini. So it's in this, you know, sort of Baroque Palazzo. And yet there's this remarkable, vast, vast canvas that, that is hanging up. And, and that to me too, it's like a, it's like a stage set. It, it's, it, it's very much, I think, looking back as she does in so many of her work, Imogen's works, you know, to the, not just to the Cubists, but almost, it's almost um, futurist as well. There's a sense of animation and yes. movement well, in the work. Well, you'll see all of the canvases in this shot are actually parallelograms. So they are slightly skewed. Um, I had a very nice conversation. We showed Imogen's work uh, a couple of years ago in Hong Kong at uh, Art Basel. And uh, one of the great things about taking work from uh, those who I work with in New Zealand to an international fair like Art Basel Hong Kong is that you get to have these amazing conversations with uh, often incredibly intelligent, well-versed uh, collectors and museum <coughs> professionals. and. Uh, I had this guy come in, I did not know who he was, but it ended up that he was quite an influential dealer who had galleries in Zurich and cool. um, other such places. But uh, we ended up talking about Imogen and these um, parallelograms, and he sort of listened to me intently for a few minutes, and then he said, to me, they are like the paintings are quoting things and are italicised. Right. Which I thought was very... <coughs> That's actually very yeah, observant. Very beautiful. Yeah, it's lovely. That's a really lovely way of interpreting them. Mm. And she carries this through into ah. the... Uh, yes. I just so wish I could have seen this in the flesh. Well, because... yeah, well, maybe you can. I don't know if anyone's going to be in Dunedin soon, but the reason why we're talking... Well, for me, the reason why we're talking about this exhibition is because, like uh, Anne Hamlet, it was um, uh, closed early and uh, the Hocken just reached out to me actually a couple of days ago and um, this is actually saving me a phone call to at least one person who's on this uh, Zoom <laughs> call. Uh, the Hocken has asked if they could extend the show. So oh, they, they want to open uh, soon and they would like to have the show up for another kind of couple of weeks and oh, to get have that. something for people to walk mm -hmm. into. They, they really want to have a space where students and the community down there in Dunedin won't just experience an empty, right. closed gallery. And can I ask, has Imogen always worked on smaller works in watercolour as well as the light? Has that always been part of her practice? I think I think the answer to that is yes. Yeah. You know, she hasn't always shown them, but she I often see this type of material in the studio. Because she's an immensely skilled watercolourist. She is. Immensely skilled. Yeah, she's, she is... The real deal. Yeah, they are really quite spectacular, but it's lovely to see them as an ensemble. Yes. As a sort of broader conversation. Well, what you don't see in this shot, unfortunately, is a very jewel-like Lois White um, oh. uh, watercolour, and it's just stunning, of these kind of dancing women, and oh, it's right. 
perfect. I, th I shall definitely try and go down. I really want to see this. I'd definitely like to get down to, to Dunedin. Yes. Um, and I thought we should maybe talk in detail about one work. Yes. Because when you show it <clears throat> on a larger scale, you can immediately see how important the texture of the canvas is within the painting. Yes. And there's this use of parallelograms that sort of dance the tango with the structure of the actual canvas itself. Yes. I mean, there's lots you can say about it. I mean, seeing this image makes me want to talk about how Imogen does say how, you know, she's really interested in how the painting hangs on the wall and the mm -hmm. fact that it is skewed mm -hmm. shifts it. You know, yes. the whole wall moves because of the way that Imogen has um, constructed the canvas itself. And she also loves to kind of talk about how the paintings themselves are somehow like not straight which of course is a bit of a pun, uh, but I don't know if Imogen yeah. has quite cheeky titles, there's a lot of humour in the work, there's a little bit of piss take. <laughs> I mean, you know, she really is drawing upon a kind of big lineage of um, predominantly New Zealand modernists. Yeah. You know, she was extremely uh, taken by the fact that she was a Francis Hodgkins fellow. She was extremely taken by the fact that she was the same age as um, Michael Illingworth when he received the Francis Hodgkins Fellowship. Um, I don't know if this is, I mean, you can see the, the very sort of textured surface of these paintings, which is achieved through using quite raw uh, sacking, mm. which is, again, like what a lot of New Zealand artists like Claremont and Thomason and even McCann used to utilize in their work so there's always yeah. a harking back it's something we're all actually quite familiar yeah with. to me yeah. I look at them and I instantly think that they are works by a kind of New Zealand vernacular mm. and all of those things about a New Zealand light and color palette they're all there in Imogen's work they're quite timeless as well I feel mm. like if you told me that this painting had been made in 1926 I'd absolutely, absolutely believe you so yeah. there's this lovely hover in my mind. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and it, it's so, it's so dynamic. Yes. Uh, and, and of course, choosing these very strong colours to place them on does also affect the way in which you read the painting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is all part of that sort of conversation. But then, you know, every time we move a painting in our houses, the painting, you suddenly look at it in a new light as well. And I think the shadow is important because it emphasises that sort of notion you know just I just keep thinking of you know woman walking down a staircase you oh, know I was thinking the same thing <clears throat> to me they're like uh, a Duchamp yeah or something. they're, they're uh, quite they're quite they have a futurist sort of frisson to them they do ah. and then we come to something quite different well yes I wanted to talk a bit about Zach because um before we talk about any work perhaps um I just wanted to say that Zach is uh, a lot like Imogen, incredibly hardworking, really like on the cusp of some interesting projects at the moment and making some very strong work. And um, look, Zach takes all of these things in his stride, but he probably has had the most <laughs> cancelled. Yeah. Uh, he had um, a residency in France that he was about to embark on. Um, he had a project over in Australia that he was working on. There was a show in Adelaide that he was a part of. There was an art fair in Cologne that he was also doing a solo project with. It actually kind of goes on for a few more things as well. And the other kind of quirk with Zach and a number of others that I work with is that they live overseas. So Zach, of course, is based in Berlin. He um, came down to New Zealand to make this show uh, early this year and intended to stay, spend some time with his parents, stay for the duration of the show. But actually, as the show <laughs> kind of unfurled, it just became more and more unlikely that he was mm. going to go back to Berlin. And then sure enough, you know, it's just like an impossible thing. So um, he has a studio back in Berlin, which he has um, empty. Uh, and he is here um, creating, well, actually a door has opened, or a window, a door. Um, Robert Leonard has taken the opportunity to kind of shoulder tap Zach and say, look, 
like, would you be interested in making a major project for us? And so, you know, there has been a silver lining yeah. and Zach is now working on a show that will actually occupy the whole top floor of the City Gallery and will be um, opening soon. Um, but yes, look, he made an amazing show for us. Uh, one of the works, uh, in fact, the major work in the exhibition has uh, gone to the Chartwell Collection. So this will also oh, feature fantastic. in the City Gallery show. <clears throat> um, maybe there's another slide there and are. I can talk to... Which one? Oh, Actually, but... maybe go back, maybe go back. Because I think that one... Yeah, I, I don't know if people will be able to see this um, on a screen. But um, Zach, uh, part of the show uh, was were these amazing uh, photographs that he made, which look like starry night skies. Um, they are contact prints, or they start their life as contact prints, where he has collected sand from very particular locations um, around the world and made these kind of photograms and then blown them up to great, to a whole new sort of scale and they really look like universes mm. um and they're sort of molecular they're very, yeah and their surfaces they, they're fascinating actually when you get close to them yeah uh, they're, they're very beautiful mm. it's a shame i mean not everything reads super well on a screen yeah. which is what we are also discovering <laughs> um but these are definitely works that are worth spending some time mm. with in real life oh they're, they're absolutely beautiful and what has always what really interests me about Zach. I mean, I think he's had an absolute stellar yeah, rise as, a, as an artist. It's happened very quickly. It's happened very, very quickly, but it's the materials that he uses. Yes. <coughs> yes, just, everything is very. Let's just jump forward, maybe. Yes. Two. Because... Yes, two is a good. Yeah, this is a good one. <coughs> you okay there? That's good. right, I just cough. <laughs> oh, you just talk. Should we put on masks? No, <laughs> just my asthma. Um. The image that you see, I hope, on your left-hand side, the passport work, um, these are some pieces that we showed, again, actually, in uh, Hong Kong at the fair, um, and really, I think, was this, this jumping point for Zach in terms of what's been happening for him internationally. Um, he made this extremely elegant presentation, which were um, uh, nine of these uh, paper nautilus shells, uh, which he then filled, you can see the interior of the shell has the impression of being filled with this very hard surface, which is actually um, meteorite. So there is, a, it's almost like a beautiful poem in a way. You have this shell, which is the, um, it's the casing mm -hmm. for the Argonaut. Um, uh, no, I've, Sorry, I think I, there's a particular type of octopus that occupies these shells that um, a lot of um, the, the legend is that they would float to the top of the surface of the ocean and hold their tentacles up and use them like a sail and float across mm -hmm. the surface of the ocean. And this is partly why some of the stories, the Greek that's, stories are based yeah. on things oh and, use the words argonaut and so forth well when i looked at this i immediately thought of the amazing collection and i i mean i only know the one in florence but at the pity palace but uh when uh renaissance travelers bought back objects to italy they bought back, amongst them they bought back these nautilus shells and they were set in silver yes on pedestals and often with quite elaborate lids and of course what Zach's done is he's inverted that notion because you've got the, sh the shell is the container, but you've got this very rare metal within it. Well, exactly. And, you know, ultimately, um, you know, there's this immense um, sense of the weight of time mm -hmm. as well. I mean, mm -hmm. some of the rock that Zach was using was... Um, had the most incredible carbon dating, you know, three billion years old and so forth. So I mean, where does he source them? Um, there are dealers, uh, right. dealers who sell right. um, uh, the, these things. So. Mm. But um, the lightness and the heaviness, um, it, it inspired a lot of people. The show went extremely well. Zach actually won this kind of like major prize as part of mm. it, which was um, funded by BMW and basically was... Um, a blank, 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 blank check 
to do whatever he liked right. for about a year. And so hence this kind of circumnavigating mm. the world, following the um, the flight patterns of birds and Pacific journeys and migration and navigation. And these are things that are really fascinating to him. Um, the Orbit Works, which is a new piece. Um, these are made from a kind of plastic um, human eye model um, in a nutshell. Uh, they hang on the wall as a kind of diptych, uh, but you'll notice that uh, the pupils have been replaced with two very uh, special um, uh, found materials. So one is um, a dandelion that has been cast in resin and then the other, in this particular instance, is a kind of obsidian, which um, again is this kind of not, I mean, it's quite different from meteorite, but it has this kind of weight of mm. the, the material. You know, it's, if you shine light in this particular instance into the obsidian, it actually um, creates a kind of iris of sorts. Well, that's what I was thinking about both of them in completely different ways. Mm. You look at that wonderful sort of polished reflective surface and then you're drawn in just the way the rays of light enter into your eye but yes. I, I'm absolutely fascinated by that you say it's plastic that's sort of molded and folded around yes. the iris yeah I mean again using found materials yeah. in an extraordinary way yeah they're absolutely because yeah. they are like fragments of bone they are. you know where, they're like the skull you know the line that joins the the cranium together. So they're incredibly complex and, yes. and yet exquisitely beautiful. Well, Absolutely That beautiful. is definitely Zach. No, yeah. I'm not sure. Do so, we have another slide or are we? I'm not sure. No. Oh, perfect. <laughs> we can either, we can talk about um, well, this, this work. It, again, want. it's a little, I'm going to say it's a little hard to read in the slide, which I'm sorry, I feel like I've given you the wrong images, but in that vitrine, you will see that there is a kind of set of, well, they're children's toys, mm, kind of. Building um, blocks, almost. Yeah, building blocks, or the kind of blocks that you might force through a kind That's of. That's right, those wooden frames. Yeah, like, um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a kind of puzzle. And uh, Zach has replaced one of those pieces with um, this wedge of meteorite. So again, kind of working with um, this very loaded material. Right. That, is it radioactive? Um, I think everything has a certain amount of radioactivity, yeah. but I wouldn't say that it's, no, I mean, we didn't wear hazmat suits or anything as we handled it. <laughs> Not as dangerous. It's as very heavy. Of course, it's like iron. Right. I mean, it's... Because yeah. those, the, 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 the colour pieces in a child's game, they're very light. They are very light. So you've got light. that juxtaposition as well. There's so many layers, I think. Yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of a bit of a reach, but I, for some reason, it reminded me of that kind of... Um, that uh, that black stone at the very beginning of Stanley Kubrick's oh, yes. uh, 2001. That's you know, right. this kind of weird thing that just doesn't quite fit. You uh, need the music as well. You do, yeah. <laughs> shall okay. we see if there's any questions? So shall we see if there's any questions, Penny? Shall I, shall I close the stop? I'll take the images down so you can see people. Yes, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, yes, we do have a question from Sue oh. Gardner. Oh, Sue Gardner. Hi. I need to unmute Sue first. Unless oh, okay. um, Michael, I, I received the wonderful publication that Imogen uh, produced as part of uh, her exhibition. Can yes. you tell us a bit about the, the publication uh, and also the drawings that are in the publication? Were they in the exhibition as well? Is this the drawing of the um, the mural that you're yeah. referring to? Mm. Yeah. Well, there, there's always studies that Imogen mm. does. Um, she is very methodical. I think she makes, well, not every single work, but there will often be a kind of watercolour that she um, creates prior to committing any marks on canvas. So that's where those drawings come from. But I think... Um, Look, that catalogue was produced by the Hocken, and it's very beautiful, I have to say. Oh, um, mm. It really does feel like a work um, that would easily fit within the exhibition, which I guess was mm. the point. But she mm. did work with a number of um, uh, queer writers, queer colleagues that she came in contact with when she was living in Dunedin. And I think that's kind of central to that particular publication, is the kind of 
um, immediate community that she formed mm. when she was on residency or in the residency. Mm. Penny, well, I've got one more question to ask Michael, if that's all right. Yes, Me. please do. <laughs> well, Michael, as, as a gallerist who has really worked very hard uh, to um, engage in the international uh, world of art and, and as many of your artists, as you're explaining about Zach, for example, many of your artists are overseas or engage between a kind of, uh, in quite a global sort of way. What's your reflection, um, thinking about certain circumstances like Zach sort of being here and opportunities emerging in New Zealand? What, what, what is your immediate have you, feeling about what's, what's going to be possible in the, in the future? Uh, maybe even just in the short term, because I don't think anyone's got a picture about what's going to happen. Yeah. Slightly longer, but um, yeah. Is there flexibility built into the way people work and you work too? Oh, I think artists are, in my experience, often the most, well, actually, no, I'm stopping myself because I was about to say they're often the most flexible and amenable to, to change. But I think that um, given the fact that this is all we've got to work with, you know, I think that people are more and more flexible and thinking on their feet and working as rapidly as we possibly can to, I know it's an overused sentiment already, but to, to find the new normal. Mm -hmm. But I think that lots <clears throat> is going to change. I mean, even the other day, a quote that we had for an air shipment that we are kind of waiting on, uh, originally that was somewhere in the region of 8,000 New Zealand dollars, the new quote is 60. So I, um, am going to find lots of moments where it, things that we would like to do are mm -hmm. just simply not as possible as they once were. Mm. And I think, you know, travel is, is a huge one as well. I mean, it's mm. just stopped, you know, no one's traveling. Mm. Um, it's very strange. I, I had a conversation with an artist the other day who is based in Toronto and in some ways, it's a kind of amazing thing to consider making a show. I haven't met the artist properly. He hasn't been to New Zealand. Um, normally, we would talk a lot about a studio visit or flying him mm. down in advance or something along those lines. But mm. that's all off the table. But mm. the conversation continues. So that's a, that's a plus. You know? yeah. It's like there are going to be positives as well as mm. negatives. Mm. Actually, I think those hints of what the positives are going to be are actually quite exciting. Yeah, you know, yeah I think there's so. There's all sorts of innovative solutions that crop up. Mm. Like, I think that's one thing that the arts is very good at is... Absolutely. ...innovation. Yeah. <coughs> Michael, you. I was just going to ask you, I wasn't sure that you told us what exhibition you have on when you do open on the 3rd of June. Ah, well, ah, oh, that's nice of you. Um, the show that we were going to have on, uh, which we've pushed to one side a number of times now, um, is the show that we're going to open with, and that is Stella Corkery. So Stella has been making work and is very keen to just kind of, you know, get back on the bike with us. And so I really appreciate that. You know, it's a really, it's, a, it's not necessarily something that I imagine every artist would mm. want to do, to be suddenly the first person uh, you know, it's like the order of a comedy show or something like that. It's like, do you want to be the first comic on stage? Probably not. But uh, she's into it. We are too. So, but in in this moment of um, reconsidering everything, we have been working on our website and how we can mm. best like make it a bit easier for people to experience the show without necessarily coming in. Um, you know, every gallery in the world has been developing. Uh, an online platform of some sort uh, and we, we're no different, we're, we're doing all these things too. So slowly, slowly, but hopefully well, we will. But also conversely, um, to be the first, we're all desperate to get to the gallery yeah. again. So, I mean, it may be a wonderful thing for Exactly, Stella. exactly. I don't, I'm just cautious on yeah, everyone's yeah. behalf. I don't think anyone really knows what it's going to be mm. like, you know. 
Um, it's going to be. And I, ha I have a question from um, Brenda Chapel. She was just wanting you to talk a little bit about the about Zach's publication, which is r really fascinating. I did go to his talk. Yes. When he had that here, and um, so she was wanting you just to talk a wee bit about that, if you could. Ah, these are good questions. They're good questions. Um, Zach. Uh, again, through the generosity of um, BMW, I have to say, um, Zach uh, launched quite a major publication. Uh, it's 200 odd pages, um, some pretty serious texts in there. Uh, and we had, or I say we, I attended it, but we had a huge launch in Miami during the fair for Zach. I mean, it was pretty incredible. Um, but Zach's publication, if, if anyone, I mean, sorry, Brenda, I'm not darting around the question, but if anyone um, wants to see these things, of course, they're all on our website as well. And we're going to try to make some of this material far more open. You don't have to necessarily buy a copy. We want people mm -hmm. to be able to access it um, uh, just via the website. But what is it in particular, Brenda, that you want to know about the publication? I'm sort of curious. Oh, Brenda's muted. I'm yeah. unmuting her. There we go. Sorry, Brenda, we need to unmute you first. Yeah, right. Uh, no, sorry, Michael, I didn't need to know personally anything about it because I have read it and you, oh, you, perfect. you gave it <laughs> um, I was just adding to the conversation about the fact that there is that publication and how yeah. marvellous it is. And it's actually a really good read in terms of trying to unpick his work. Yes. Quite I've always thought that, I mean, I've been very interested in publication or publishing alongside the gallery. And when we have had the opportunity, it's something that I like to do. I mean, in many ways, um, the kind of thing that we're trying to do with our website and viewing rooms and all of this kind of thing is also, or has been there with our efforts in publications, or publishing, I should say. Um, we want people to experience the work when they are not in the gallery. Uh, we want to be able to send curators and collectors all around the world a kind of token of something to do with that artist, something that's tangible. And I, I have found that with publications, it's been, uh, it's filled quite a big part of what we do. I feel like that's quite mm. vague, but um, no, I think it's uh, the, all of these things are they go hand in hand in my mind. And although we have, you know, right from the very beginning, we've published uh, in a way that possibly a smaller gallery, as we were when I first opened, uh, might have been seen as quite brave. I hope, uh, but we really wanted mm. to kind of keep kind of adding to the project, adding to an artist. Well, it does add real value to it in yeah. all sorts of levels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, more and more, I have to say, with the demise of various media outlets in New Zealand, uh, there's just so little opportunity for artists to have work written about. Uh, and I think that websites are really important, but I personally love the physicality yes. of something that's published. Um, <laughs> so there's a kind of balance there. Thank we goodness have, for Art News. <laughs> we have a question from Trish Gribben. So Trish, I've unmuted you and you can... Oh, how quick. It's a, it's a strange question, I suppose, Michael. Zach's dandelion in resin. I was yes. completely fascinated by that. Did he make that himself or was it a found object? That particular piece is, would have been a found object, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Where does one find a dandelion in resin? He knows how to Google, yeah. I would imagine. Yeah, okay. well, a lot of Googling. They do make them into paperweights, yes, don't they? Exactly. So oh, it may have been yeah. a form of paperweight. Yeah. Well, frivolous question, but I was fascinated. Oh, that's oh, good. Well, I think that's about all that wraps up all the questions for now. And um, so a, a very special thank you from all of us at the foundation to you, Michael, for being uh -huh. with Mary tonight. Lovely to see the two of you together rather than everyone being apart. So <laughs> a sign of the times. Exactly. It's like 
we couldn't sit in separate houses. So it would it be odd. Too, it so. would be odd. But it would be nice. Yeah. Very nice. Really lovely to hear what you're up to. And we wish you the best of luck when you do open on the 3rd of June. We all look forward to coming in and seeing yeah. you. And um, just also to let everyone know that next week's cocktail chat is going to be with Reuben Patterson, Sue Gardner, talking with Reuben in his home down in New Plymouth. So hope you can all join us then. So over and out, thank you very much, Mary and oh, Not at all. Thanks Pleasure. for having me. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah, it was great.